I believe that Columbia is one of the unique experiences in the world. It is kind of plastic in that um, it has no character and no history. What I don't like is that we have such minimum transportation here. I think that there needs to be some sort of place where teenagers can go like at night and hang out and like just hang around because we get kicked out of every place we go. <laughs> a great place to live. Oh no, there's a guy There's a man there. up there! Whoa. Yeah. How long have you lived here? Oh, seven, eight years. Do you know anything about the Columbia concept? No, I honestly don't. Before it became a city, Columbia, Maryland was an idea. The time was the early 1960s, an age of American innocence and hope. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. It was also a time of turmoil, of struggle for human growth. Because I have a dream. My poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream. American cities were growing too spreading inexorably to the suburbs. The era spawned the term urban sprawl. James Rouse, then a Baltimore developer, conceived the idea of Columbia. We saw all around us the dreadful results of sprawl. We would build something and then that would just generate uh, filling stations and hot dog stands. And, and of course, this has been the problem in the growth of the American city. In this environment of idealism, struggle, and growth, an idea occurred to Rouse that would address some problems of the day. He wondered about building a new town in the corridor between Baltimore and Washington, D.C., a town to be unspoiled by either sprawl or segregation. The concept dawned on him slowly. Everybody looks for that road to Damascus uh, shaft of light, but it didn't happen that way. It was really the, the approaching the, the irrationality of city and uh, seeing in our work uh, that it could be rational, and therefore, let's find out if it's doable. He proposed it to his colleagues at the Rouse Company. So we made a hypothetical study of building a city of 100,000 people. Could it be done? Would it work? Uh, would it be economic to do it? And the results of that study said it would. The Baltimore-Washington corridor was projected to grow by a million people in the next 15 years. The Rouse Company cast its eye near the middle of the corridor, on farmland in rural Howard County. The vision was a better city. We said from the first days of planning, we're not trying to build a perfect city, but we believe it ought to be easily possible to produce a better city. But many obstacles lie on the road from dream to reality. The first was money. Rouse approached Fraser Wild, then chairman of the Connecticut General Life Insurance Company. He was the one man I knew in America who I felt uh, uh, could understand the importance of building a city, presided over enough money to help us do it, and had the guts to do it if he made up his mind. We resolved an arrangement by which they would put up all the money to buy the land, to carry it, uh, pay the taxes, carry the interest. We would put a million dollars into the, all the pre-development and planning function, and we would uh, own the development 50-50. And uh, that's why this is named Wild Lake. His name was Fraser Wild. The Rouse Company began buying the land in February 1963. 165 farms and parcels, totaling nearly 21 square miles, an area the size of Manhattan. Secrecy was maintained to keep prices from skyrocketing. There were a lot of rumors that the Russians were acquiring it, that the West Germans were acquiring it, that the United Nations was acquiring it. Nobody suspected a small development company in Baltimore. But how do you build a city from farmland? from scratch, and what do you put in it? The questions were posed to a work group of 14 people assembled from across the country, teachers, doctors, sociologists, 
people who knew about living in cities. They met every two weeks for the next four months. Rouse told them they were not building utopia. What we said to them was that we wanted to explore the optimums of urban life. We wanted to talk about the best possible education system, the best possible health system. What about employment? Uh, what were the causes of victory? What were the causes of defeat in the human sense in the, in the urban environment? Four major goals were established for Columbia. One was to respect the land. We, we believed it was possible for man to build his settlements without desecrating the land. In fact, ennobling the land, we said at the time. The 14,000 acres that we acquired, 5,000 are permanent open space. We preserved all the stream valleys, all the floodplains, all the steep hills. The second goal was to be a real city, not just a better suburb. It was our goal to produce as many jobs as there were workers here. We wanted people of all income levels. We wanted to be very open racially to provide the full institutional life of cities. And our third goal was to produce an environment that uh, was felicitous for the life and growth of the man, the woman, and the family. We couldn't say you got to be a community, but we could facilitate the kinds of institutions and relationships that might cause people to feel a community relationship. And that led to the, the basic plan of small neighborhoods uh, centered around an elementary school of uh, five to six hundred kids with a park and a playground and a swimming pool and a little store. And our fourth goal was to make a profit. So if, it, uh, if you could build the rational city and make money, why keep on building the irrational city? Work began in 1963. There was special new town zoning to obtain, lakes and dams to build, sewers and roads to lay down, public buildings to erect, and houses to build. We wanted it to be very open racially, and this was back in 67 when the first families were coming here. We had black hostesses and white hostesses in the exhibit building. We made it a absolute rule that no, no uh, developer, no salesman, no leasing broker, no one could answer the question, what is the color of the person who's going to live next door? And we enforced that rigidly. We said, if you don't want to take your chance racially, don't come to Columbia. And I became very excited because I had looked for many, many years in Baltimore County and had been turned down because of my race. The town was named after the old Columbia Pike Road, once the main highway between Washington and Baltimore. The first resident moved in July 14, 1967, French Independence Day. That was a marvelous, uh, marvelous day. We felt like pioneers, and we felt like every day there was change. There was an opportunity to meet people from all over, all ages, all kinds of backgrounds, and we became friends very quickly. Building by building, family by family, village by village, the town grew. But because of planning, there was no sprawl, no roadside hot dog stands. Economic swings of recession and high interest rates brought somewhat slower growth than planners had forecast. Yet Columbia harnessed the energy of private and public sectors to forge the major institutions needed for a real city. Public schools, a general hospital, a pioneer health maintenance organization, a community college, one of the nation's busiest public libraries, a large inviting shopping mall, the Meriwether Post Pavilion, a flourishing weekly newspaper, and a city magazine. Many of the institutions grew to become outstanding. The U.S. Department of Education recognized several exemplary schools in the country this year at the White House. Of the six schools in the state of Maryland, three were from Howard County, one of which was Wild Lake Middle. The institutions are run through a system of governance that's unique to Columbia. It begins in the villages. And then we create a village board in every village so there would be the opportunity for people to, to feel organized into community, to express opinions, uh, advocate things, fight things to, to, to be a community. A citizen can come in and say exactly what's on their minds, which I think allows them to speak freely and to get information. There are a number of subcommittees and so forth that they can't participate in, and we strongly encourage citizens to come in and become part of the governance process. We think this is key to the Columbia concept.
Village centers also host activities each night and provide information to residents. Each village has an architectural board which reviews plans to modify the exterior of houses. I object democratically to the idea that you can't uh, do what you want with your house. Very much so. I like that because it protects my property. Each village also elects a representative to the Columbia Council, the guiding body of the Columbia Association, known as CA. The CA provides bus service, recreational facilities, child care, summer camps, and other services. It also manages the city's open space. The Columbia Association owns that land, develops it in terms of the parks or the lakes or the pathways, maintains it. And it's um, a permanent legacy that Columbia will have not only now, but in generations to come. Money for this comes from assessments that businesses and homeowners pay on their property and from fees that CA charges to use some of its recreational facilities. Some people think the fees are too high. We were going to have a family picnic and there are going to be 10 to 15 kids that we wanted to take swimming. And we called the CA office and they told us it was going to be over $100. And we said that was ridiculous. We just didn't need to spend that much money for a short swim. <laughs> Howard County government is also a key part of the Columbia governance system, providing fire and police protection, public schools, and many other services. The Howard County Council is responsible for zoning, issuing permits, and passing laws that control Columbia. The county has been supportive of its new and unique city. What Columbia did was to provide for a managed growth, and, and that was very much welcome by those who live here in the county and who knew that growth was going to come. The Rouse Company, as developer of the land, still plays a role in Columbia's life. It sells remaining land to commercial, industrial, and residential developers and approves architectural plans. It also builds, leases, and manages some key commercial properties, including the flagship Columbia Mall. I think there's a, a, a very minimal influence anymore terms of, uh, of the Rouse Company's activities. Well, I think a few of us believe that the Rouse Company, since they are the owners of the land, have, have the most to say about the development pattern. We're a part of this community. We function in the community, and we're going to be here for a long time. So I think there's an openness and receptiveness to community comment. As the city established its major institutions and governance system, the human institutions grew too. Some say that Columbia has more organizations than it does people. The groups link together residents who invariably moved here from other places. Being with people is a major part of it, and of course we enjoy uh, each other's company and we enjoy uh, the associations that we uh, make here in uh, community music. In 1987, Columbia turned 20. For the city, as for a person, it marks a time of passage from youth to maturity. Residents feel that many of the city's goals have been met. Preserving the land is one. It's just like being in a different part of the world. I mean, we're close to Washington, we're close to Baltimore, but when you get into Columbia, it's just, it's tranquil. I just find it hard to believe that there's 70-some thousand people living, you know, in close proximity to you. Uh, but I also find that very nice. <laughs> there's uh, close to 60 miles of pathways here, you know, that, that pass behind many of the homes in the community, most of the homes in the community. So you're very close to a system that you can go out and, and within 200 yards be out of sight of your home and in fact in many instances out of sight of any home. Another goal that seems to work is racial equality. Vernon Gray raised two children here. And I think they have grown up uh, with a positive outlook on, uh, on themselves, a positive outlook on Columbia and a positive outlook on society as a whole because they have had the opportunity to interact on a regular basis with uh, children of other races and creeds and national origin. And if you look today, 
there isn't a village, um, a neighborhood, a cul-de-sac in Colombia that isn't racially integrated to the point where that's not an issue today. The goal of providing work and commerce brought 1,700 businesses and 40,000 jobs to Colombia in the first 20 years. It is a good place to get and hold employees. It's a place where the employees can get a nice place to work, can raise their kids, and have plenty of cultural and social activities. The businesses brought a strong tax base, so Columbia could keep its promise to Howard County of generating more tax dollars than it consumes. And Columbia has, every year since the third year of development, done that. Huge surplus now to the county from Columbia. But not every goal has been an unqualified success. No complaint except the getting the transportation, and I think that's a common complaint with all of us. Bus service is very infrequent. You can't get around. On weekends, uh, Sundays especially, there's no transportation. Transportation system is a big disappointment. It was simply not possible within the technology that we had then to provide a transportation system that substituted in any significant way for the automobile. Uh, I still wonder about that. A key Columbia goal was to create a sense of community through the village concept. Planners even designed community mailboxes as a place where people could meet and become friendly. The community concept has worked in many ways. Oh, I'm definitely a neighborhood pharmacist. Wherever I go, I, uh, I am known, and that's, it's an ego trip. It makes you feel real good. Life here on a daily basis is very easy, which allows time for recreation and growth in all other kinds of ways. But as the city has grown in size, it's also grown more impersonal. When we moved to the area, I was hoping that our neighbors would be a little bit more friendly or would come and introduce themselves to us and welcome us to the area. But we haven't had that. We've almost had to approach them, and it, it's, been, it's been difficult. I think if you don't go out of your way, you probably wouldn't make friends that easily. But if you, there are a lot of different things to join and to belong to, and if you want to be active, there's a good chance for it, and you can meet a lot of people. Another key Columbia goal was affordable housing for people of all incomes. Barbara Pert lives in low-income housing. This was supposed to be the truly mixed community, but lower-income people are now being eliminated because the cost of housing has risen so much. Cutbacks in federal funding have made it difficult to provide enough low-income housing. You end up with largely upper-income people, and then those few people that are able to live in the subsidized housing that exists in the community. The environment becomes very sterile. It misses what a cosmopolitan city has, which is groups of people interacting and stimulating each other to areas of thought that they wouldn't necessarily be involved in or thinking about. We announced that we were an open community and would remain an open community throughout our life and we are committed to that. I think there's a lot that can be done, that housing can be provided for people who earn low incomes. I don't think anybody particularly wants a large concentration of low income people in any one area. But certainly, nobody minds that people who want the opportunity and who are willing to be good neighbors can live here regardless of their income. Another goal was to make Columbia a real city. I consider it a suburb. Oh, it's a city. The development of downtown is crucial to whether Columbia becomes a full-fledged real city. The things that unify a city today are missing here, and it's the way you infill between all of the, all these vacant spaces that are now parking lots, how do we infill those in a way that it all comes together and becomes a unified whole? It has a long way to go yet because it's just beginning. Some people would like to see a large auditorium built in downtown Columbia. The strength of the waterfront, uh, the lakefront, is really dependent upon getting more uh, high density or medium density housing and obviously additional restaurants and entertainment uses. 
We're concerned that there be good opportunities for cultural events in Columbia, that there be arts in public places, that downtown be a people place. With the help of, uh, of, of a good, strong market, with the help of community participation, it can't uh, be anything but a people place. And I believe there are a lot of intelligent people in the community who care to be involved in the process, and I think that's really what we believe is essential to have a really outstanding downtown. There ought to be a, uh, a livelier downtown, not in place of the mall, but uh, in addition to the mall. And I think it, it's going to take some concentration on the Rice Company's part to, uh, uh, to make that happen, and the community's part to see that the Rice Company makes it happen. James Rouse retired from the Rouse Company in 1979 to begin a foundation that helps to house the poor. But he agreed to make some educated guesses about Columbia's future. Columbia will become, in 20 years, clearly the third major city in the uh, Columbia, Washington area. What will be called Columbia, which means Columbia and its developed environs, will be a city of, oh, 300,000 people, maybe more, maybe half a million. The commercial facilities will grow tremendously. The mall will have uh, uh, six department stores instead of three. There will be ten village centers. They'll grow. There will be uh, an opera house, a, a symphony hall. There will be a stadium in which uh, not big league sports will be played, but soccer may become by then a very major sport in Colombia. Colombia may be one of the leading cities in the country. The environment that exists in Colombia will be preserved. The people are vigilant. Uh, the Columbia Association is vigilant. It won't, won't let it be otherwise. Places like this wild lake will be just treasures. See, the whole path system, this 5,000 acres of open space in this city of 100,000 people will make it one of the outstanding cities in the United States. But growth and success also has its penalties. Some people fear the community has become complacent. And I really worry a little bit that the early years of Columbia were inspired by creative thought, where people were constantly looking to figure out a better way of doing it. And I really think we've lost a great deal of that um, early creative thought process. I think there was a stronger sense of community. Columbia has gotten so large that we've lost a lot that we originally had. The future will require new leaders, new vision, and renewed commitment to Columbia's original goals. Mr. Rouse and the planners did not design the human institutions. That was for the people to create. There are many folks here who are older, and are we providing the appropriate facilities and services for the needs of the community today. CA could become a far more significant community institution than it is today. But the larger question for the future is, is whether CA wants to uh, be something more than a, uh, a parks and recreation association. The role of the citizens will be much more center stage, and it was always planned to be that way. The thing that would upset me more than anything else, I think, is if people become totally apathetic and not maintain an involvement in their community and not continue to grow and continue to shape the community to meet the demands of the community as the community itself grows, as people change. In beginning Columbia, James Rouse was inspired by lines of the poet Johann Goethe. The words seem fitting as well for Columbia's future. Whatever you can do or believe you can, begin it. Boldness has genius, power, and magic in it. <laughs> <laughs>